title of my Bible study tonight is just basically this. How can a person know they are saved? Just a very simple title. And I guarantee that that is a question that though men may not take it of great importance, it is one that matters as much or more than any other question that a man can answer. How can you know that you're saved? And does that, does that interest anybody? I mean, anybody sit there and think, wow, I... You know, the fact is, if you've studied your Bible, you probably have some idea about how to answer that question. But I have a, I have a feeling, even though... That, that's the kind of question that I know if I sat down and a guy came up to the pulpit and he announced that in his title, I would be interested. Because I'm interested in how a man can know they're saved. I'm interested to know how I can know I'm saved. I'm interested... And I, I would be interested because... When questions of that, of that caliber, of that weightiness are set forth, I, I always have interest. I want to know, okay, I mean, what are there? Are there ten steps? Are there five steps? Or can, I, can I know? Let's start by saying this. I just said, how can we know we're saved? Let's take that word, the, the term saved. You know, a lot of times today when we talk about that word saved, you know, it's thrown around a lot. You see it flashing in the lights. Jesus saves. But what in the world are we even talking about? A lot of people have this idea, saved. Well, what? They got religion? Sometimes people equate that. I'm saved. Okay, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to church. <coughs> yeah, but wait, we don't talk that way. If, if, if my child runs out of here, runs out in the traffic, and one of you guys heroically rescues them off the bumper of the front end of a car just before impact, and they say, he saved him. Well, okay, we understand that language. We, you see, a lot of times today when, the, when it gets... When it gets to do, and it has to do with religion, when it has to do with Christianity, when it has to do with our souls, a lot of times today, that term saved, it's, it's got the guts pulled out of it. People talk about that, but the fact is, it's a word that we use when somebody's rescued from destruction. When somebody's rescued from danger. That's where that word saved comes in. Christ came into the world to save men. We call Christ a Savior because He came to rescue men from danger. He came to rescue women from danger. This idea about I got saved means that I was in great peril and I've been rescued from it. That's the idea here. It isn't just, well, I got religion, I'm going to church now, I bought a Bible, I've been reading some stuff. It, it isn't the idea of just, you know, I, I got right with God and you know everything's going to be good now and there's going to be money in the checking account and my marriage is going to be good and... This, you know, there's a lot of this health, wealth, prosperity stuff going around today that basically saved means what? I'm not going to be, you listen to the Joel Osteens out there, and basically saved means best life now. Means I'm not going to have financial difficulties now. Means I'm not going to have marital problems now. Means all the clientele is going to come through the door at the office now. Is that what saved means? God forbid. Like I say, the guts have been pulled out of this thing. Salvation isn't that. And by the way, God never promised that you're going to be rich in this life. And God never promised you're going to escape suffering in this life. But what He did promise is the present sufferings are not to be compared with the glory that's going to be revealed. But He never promised. In fact, He says, Satan's going to throw some of you in prison. He promised. Only through much tribulation are you going to enter that kingdom. And by the way, that's for all of God's people, not just some select little group that lived in the first century. And if you think otherwise, you've read your Bibles wrong. Because suffering is the lot 
of Christians. You don't even talk in terms like that, that the present sufferings are not worthy to be compared if there isn't present sufferings. There are. What in the world are we saved from? When we start talking about that, we're not saved from poverty. We're not saved from a mediocre life now. That's not what salvation is all about. That's not why Christ is called the Savior. And I'll tell you the reason why that term saved has been so gutted in this day. I'll tell you the exact reason why. Because sin has been gutted. And because men and women don't any longer realize just how wicked their sin is and what it deserves. Let me remind you something. Have you ever read in Romans chapter 8 how the whole creation groans? Do you know why that happened? Do you know why the whole creation came under a curse? Do you know why it groans? Do you know why it is open and prone to decay right now? Do you know why this whole creation is longing for an end of this age? Because of one man's one sin. One sin through the entire universe into well, basically into decay into the second law of thermodynamics. It brought death. It brought condemnation. One man's sin, one time. Listen. Let me ask you something. I throw... I mean, this is just Bible. You guys know this. There's a day uh, Peter jumps out of the boat. And you know he's walking to the Lord. Lord, if it's you, you know, bid me come to you. He says, come. He jumps out of the boat, he's walking along, he starts looking at the waves, he starts sinking. What does he say? Lord, save me. That's where you use terms like that. Save me. Why? There's peril here. I'm going down. There's winds and waves and I'm going down. Lord, save me. He looked to this one who he knew could help him. Or take another time. Again, it's out on the same sea. There's, there's waves. There's, there's peril. Jesus sleeping in the end of the boat. They wake him up. Lord, save us. Again, there's peril. There's danger. This is the idea of this word. So often, now just listen to this. You know this, Revelation 21 8. As for the cowardly, who are the cowardly? You know what? Somebody that won't stand up for Christ. You get in the workplace, you get out there, you get in the family, you're too embarrassed. You deny Christ. Remember what he said? You deny him, he's going to deny you. You take those cowardly people, you put them with the faithless. Who are the faithless? Those are the people that don't trust Christ, the people that don't trust God. The people who live in this world, and you know what? When times get tough, they depend on the dollar, they depend on human resources, they depend on the strength of men, they depend on the way men do things, they depend on everything but God. Those are the faithless, they don't have faith. The detestable, they just. They're detestable. They're, they're unclean. They're filthy people. They're, their lives are full of perversions. Murderers. Murderers. Were you not told that if you hate your brother, you're a murderer? You, just, you hate people. Your life is full of that. Sexually immoral. Again, Christ said you look at somebody with lust, you've committed the act already. Sorcerers. I mean, there's a close connection with the original word right there and just drug abuse and that type of thing. Idolaters. I mean, you just treasure anything more than you treasure God. All liars. Do we have any liars here? Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. You say, I don't know. You just told a little white lie. You tell a white lie, guess what? You're liars. You know where liars find their place? Liars find their place in the lake that burns with fire. When we start talking about being saved, you, you guys full well know that in Romans chapter 5, it says we are saved from the wrath of God. Let me tell you something. You know, you know what a four letter scary word is in the Bible? F U R Y. Fury. You just do a little search on that word. Fury. Let me tell you something about how God responds to sin with fury. 
we belittle it. We look at sin as though it's nothing. We look at we look at just you know we're we're we hate somebody. We're mean. So we get a little glance there of you know a little bit of perverseness, a little sexual sin committed in the mind, a little lie. You know, we, we look at these things, we so minimize these things. Listen to this. Just, just imagine this. Okay, here you are. You're here tonight. Let me, let me tell you. Let me ask you how you would feel if I said to you this. Guess what? I had a word from the Lord today about you. You exactly. God gave me a word. Well, let's say, this is the real deal. Let's say, I'm a real prophet. I got a word from the Lord concerning you. And I said this to you. I know you think your sin's small, but listen to what God told me. Behold, the name of the Lord comes from afar, burning with His anger and in thick rising smoke. His lips are full of fury and His tongue is like a devouring fire. His breath is like an overflowing stream that reaches up to the neck to sift the nations with the sieve of destruction and a place on the jaws of the peoples of bridle that leads astray. And the Lord will cause His majestic voice to be heard and the descending blow of His arm to be seen in furious anger and a flame of devouring fire with a cloudburst and storm and hailstorms. That comes from Isaiah 30. And guess what? Those are actual words that the actual Lord spoke concerning actual sinners. Let me give you another little example. Behold, the Lord will come in fire and His chariots like the whirlwind to render His anger in fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord enter into judgment and by His sword with all flesh and those slain by the Lord shall be many. This is God's Word. Those slain by the Lord shall be many. He comes in a way... Let, let's say, this is you. This is what God has told me about you. He is coming with that kind of flaming fire. He is coming with that kind of fury. He's coming with that kind of intent to cause you destruction because of your sin. He has not looked at it as a small thing. Folks, what I'm reading to you is how God has responded to sin before. Remember, one man sinned one time. He threw the entire creation into decay and into breakdown into a curse. What I'm reading to you right there is how God in the Old Testament has responded to those who are in sin. He has responded in a way that if you thought, man, so many people have an idea. Oh, their sin's a little thing. God's basically a Santa Claus. They go around, you know, be saved. Oh, that's just a, you know, it's a, it's a small thing. I guarantee you being saved is not a small thing. When God uses that kind of language, you say, oh, that's Old Testament. That's garbage. That's God. Because when you come to the New Testament, you come to the book of Romans, chapter 2, he says basically the same thing. Those who are self-seeking do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness. There will be wrath and fury. There is going to be indignation, folks. Wrath, fury, indignation. There is going to be the fierce anger of God upon sinners. When God says that Christ is a Savior, when it says that God has made Him to be both Prince and Savior, this, this is a big deal. This is a huge deal. Men need to be saved. But now, here's the thing. Think with me here. Think with me. I'm dealing with how you can know whether you're saved. But think, think about the categories we have. There's basically four categories, are there not? There are people who are saved and know they're saved. <coughs> right? I mean, you got the Apostle Paul. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. He knows. He had confidence, right? Here's a man he's saved. He knows he's saved. Then what do you have? What could 
What could we possibly have in another group? Those who are saved in what? Don't know they're saved. Is that possible? Would the Bible lead us to believe that it would be possible to be saved and not know it? Can anybody think of any place? Is there a scripture in either first or second Peter? That says well, I don't know. But Make your calling and election sure? No. Is that what you're thinking? Something like they forget the Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's second Peter. Okay. There, there are places that, okay, what came to my mind was like 1 Thessalonians 5. We are, it speaks about the feeble. It speaks about the weak. Now here's the thing. Why was 1 John written? That you may know that you have life. I mean, it was written for that purpose. It was written to give that confidence. Oftentimes in the Bible, God says to His people, Fear not. I mean, why, why say that? Because God's people can become fearful. What's, what's one of the things that Satan is called? Accuser. He's called the accuser of the brethren. And I'll tell you what, he accuses... Anybody remember when Charles Leiter came here? He basically emphasized the devil will accuse us to God, accuse God to us, accuse us to one another, but he also will accuse us to ourselves. Basically, you know, look at yourself. He'll, if the Christian falls into sin, Satan can come along and say, look at you, you're no Christian, you're no child of God. You wouldn't have done that if you were really a child of God. He will sit there and accuse. That's what Satan does. So yes, it's definitely possible for a true child of God to have some doubts. But let me ask you something. Well, let's go on. What are the two other possible categories? that you're not saved and you think you are, where do we see that in the Bible? All right. The text we're very familiar with out of Matthew 7, verses 21 through 23. What do you have there? You have Jesus Christ saying, it's not everybody that says to me, Lord, Lord, going to inherit the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of His Father. Now, listen. What you got there is you got people saying, you know what, we prophesied, we cast out demons, we did mighty, many mighty works, and he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. So what's that? They thought they were saved, and he says, I never knew you. So you got people who thought they were saved, and they weren't. Well, it's the other possible category. They're not saved, and they know they're not saved. Where would be an example of that in the Bible, possibly? <coughs> And the one that came to my mind right off is Philippian jailer. What must I do to be saved? Well, you don't ask that question unless you come to the realization you're lost, right? Of course, there's a guy who just immediately after that got saved. But something else I thought about too was Pharaoh. He said, who's the Lord that I should obey Him? And he's basically acknowledging. I don't have anything to do with Him. Rich young ruler? Yeah, what... what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? Went away sorrowful. Whether he really thought he was unsaved or even what that meant, it's hard to know, but he did walk away sorrowful. But here's the thing. Here's one thing I want you guys to think about. Let's take all four of those groups. Saved, know they're saved. Saved, maybe have some doubts. Not saved, think they are. Not saved, and know they're not saved. Let me ask you this. When you survey the basic landscape of mankind, how many do you think fall into each of those groups? Let's, let's start from the beginning. Saved and know they're saved. You look across the whole landscape of the world, how many do you think fit in that category? Let's use a biblical term. How about few? Right? Lord, are the few going to be saved? He says, I'll tell you this. You better strive to enter in because there are going to be many who are going to be striving to enter in. They're going to be seeking to press in. They're not going to be able to. Broad is the way. There's many on there. Narrow, and there's few on it, folks. Matthew 7. Luke 13 is the other place that's talked about. Are the few? They asked him. His disciples asked because he was saying some things. They're saying, whoa, this doesn't sound like many getting in there, Lord. 
And he says, you're exactly right, boys. Those who are saved and know they're saved are few. So those who are saved and have some struggles and doubts about it are what? There are fewer. If there are few that are truly saved, then those who are saved and doubt it have to come from that group, and they're even smaller. So few find it, even fewer would ever be in the place where they would truly be saved and have doubts. Not be on a good place. What does Jesus say about those who think they're saved but aren't? Many. Many. <coughs> Folks, that's the reality. I'll tell you what, being saved is the most critical thing that you could ever be confronted with. And the fact is, there are only few who are. But I'll tell you this, Jesus Christ came into this world to seek and to save. Save from what? They called His name Jesus because He would save His people from their sins. But He also, as it says in 1 Thessalonians, it says it in, in Romans chapter 5, He came to save His people from the wrath of God. He came to save people from that. What I read to you from Isaiah, that is not some fairy tale. That is God. Listen, the Bible says if you obey not Jesus Christ, John 3.36, it says the wrath of God abides upon you already. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Let me tell you something. God is a consuming fire. And you fall into His hands. I think, I was thinking to myself about people that I know who have died. We had a young man in our church is married to one of the sisters in the church. They, he, he left her. He abused her. He was a member of our church. We put him under discipline. God killed him. And I think about that young man, and you know, I was thinking, probably in the last 24 hours, nobody's even thought about him. Probably his mom, his ex-wife, probably haven't even thought about him. And I was thinking about where he is. And I was thinking about these texts. He didn't die saved. He died cocaine overdose, neck deep in his sin. And there is this God who it says if you die in your sin, there will be fury and there will be wrath and there will be indignation and there will be tribulation. Folks, being saved is a huge thing. You fall into the hands of that God. I, I was just imagining, he fell into the hands of that God and he screamed with a blood-curdling scream if he could. I don't know what's possible when you leave your body behind to be put in the ground here, but such terror filled that young man that is unimaginable and undescribable. And I'll tell you what, sin is no small thing. God, listen, do we need to be saved? God does not send His Son to the cross and crush Him and squeeze His soul out and pour it out like water if man did not need to be saved. He does not send His Son here to the earth to be humiliated in the form of a servant, take upon Himself that form of man, obey all the way to the cross, and I mean obey through separation of His Father, somehow a breaking apart of the Father and the Son, and who knows, some unimaginable forsaking. We, we can't even hardly go there. That doesn't happen unless men need to be saved and are in a great peril. This is no small thing, folks. This is huge. He sent His Son to be the Savior of the world. And you don't send your Son, God Almighty in human flesh, the Son of God, to walk this earth and to die that kind of death unless men and women were in serious and grave trouble. 
This is not a small thing. Men and women need to be saved. They are standing on the edge of such peril as has not even entered their mind. And I'll tell you what, lost men and lost women, they go to that edge of death and they don't have the fear. Men don't walk around in fear. But let me tell you this, the reason they don't is because they don't know what's coming. And because most of them haven't read their Bibles. But let me take you and show you a picture. I can show you the Son of God. And He's the one who created. He's the one who created hell. He knows hell. He knows what separation is. He knew what was coming. And let me show you Him. Let me show you Him in the garden. He's sweating blood. He's pleading with His Father that if there's any other way possible, let this cup be taken away from me. Father, let it be taken away. Because He knew what was coming. Lost men and lost women, they head out into eternity and they don't even realize. In their ignorance, they don't realize. But here's one who did realize. And I'll tell you what, the Son of God, He knew what was coming. And He recoiled everything in Him. Recoiled. Here was one who wanted. Here was one who came to do the will of the Father. And yet everything in Him recoiled if it would be possible. Father, because what men and women need to be saved from was going to be poured out on His head. Saved. It's not a small thing. How can you know if you're saved? How can I truly know if I'm no longer a child of wrath, but I'm now a child of God? How can I know this? What does the Bible say? What does Christ say? There are ways we can know. How? Let me throw one at you. I mean, I want to give you I want to give you guys solid biblical answers. Saved. <coughs> Look, and let in case you doubt you're one who really is all that bad. I I highly commend to you to go home tonight and read Romans chapter 3. There are four really strong words in that chapter. One, all are under sin. They're under the power of sin. All. Both Jew and Greek. I think that's about verse 9. As you begin to read a little further, like verse 10, you find what? There's none righteous, no, not one. You find that there's none that does good. You read a little further. It says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Let me tell you something. There's not one that's good. There's not one that's righteous. They're all under sin. There's none that have reached the glory of God. They've all fallen short of it. All. How can we know? How can we know if we're in? How can we know if we're out? And if lots of people, if many, are going to get there on that day and they're going to find out they're out when they thought they're in, and if only few there be that find it, this is a critical question and this is a question that lots of people go wrong on. And you know what? They didn't have to. I guarantee you that people that go wrong on this question, they go wrong because they don't read their Bibles. Or they read them and they're blind to them. Oh, lots of people got a Bible under their arm, but they don't seem to be able to see what's in the Bible. Isn't it amazing? Don't you guys come across that all the time? You have people all over the place. Guys standing in pulpits preaching. Guys in universities. Guys in seminaries. Guys in Bible colleges. Guys all over. It's amazing. But you know what? It's just like the Lord's Day. You go 2,000 years ago, what was it? And they scoffed at those Galilean fishermen, but I'll tell you what, those guys, they had the truth. All your high, stiff-collared Pharisees and scribes, lawyers, or the religious elite, the pompous, high, 
spiritual folks. Isn't it amazing? They missed it. Christ says to them, how will you escape damnation? You hypocrites. They had the law. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? You guys ever read Isaiah chapter 6? It's reiterated in the New Testament. You know what God says? He's going to give people eyes and ears that are just going to be sightless, deaf. Word of God carried around in the Bible. They open it up and they can't see. They can't see. It's there. They just can't see it. You try to point it out to them, oh, it does make them angry, make them mad. They don't want to see it. God says you shut their eyes. It's amazing. They've try to help them open their eyes. and What does the Bible say? I'll tell you one thing it says. Listen to this. This comes from Psalm 25-2. Oh my God, I trust in You. What, what simple words. Oh my God, I trust in You. Here you have the assertion of David. Lord God, I trust You. You know what? I'd start out right there. What does a man need to be saved? He needs faith. But listen, the Bible tells us in no uncertain terms that there is a faith that does not save. One of the strongest places you can go to prove that would be someplace like James chapter 2. There is a dead faith. There's a dead faith that does not save. There's a dead faith that's no better than demon faith. The demons have belief, faith. The, the demons believe. What good does that do them? They tremble in what they believe. And James says it doesn't, doesn't do any good. How am I going to know if I have a true faith versus an untrue faith? You know what David says? Lord, I trust You. I trust you. I just ask you guys this. this. This is the thing. True faith, you're in. It can be as small as a mustard seed. And I know I've told this before. Charles Leiter tells this and I love it. And it's, it's great. Folks, you can have dead faith. You can be just like the guys in Matthew 7. You can be all confident. Boy, you're just confident you're in there. <coughs> You've done all these things. You've got this high education. You've got this, you know, you've, you've been there. You've, you've even done some miraculous things and you've seen it. You've been there. God's moved. You've been in the midst of that. You know your doctrine. You're well educated. You've got degrees behind your name. You've got different things. Let me tell you something. As Charles pointed out before, you can have two bridges. One made like a Golden Gate Bridge. This thing has massive structure and steel and that thing is solid. You got some old rickety collapsed thing made out of vines and rotting boards. Ain't going to hold anybody. You got a poor, doubting, struggling, weak person over here. <coughs> Their faith is wavering. Oh, I don't know if this big old massive Golden Gate Bridge is going to hold me and he's struggling, but he's got just enough faith to go out there. Guess what? That bridge is going to hold solid. You got this guy over here, boy, he's confident. He waltzes out on that thing and he falls to his destruction. I tell you, there's a lot of people real confident in a lot of things. They're going to find out in the end their faith was no better than the bridge they built it on. And that bridge was rotten to the core. And it's going down. And there may be some little struggling, weak, faint-hearted Christian and they're going to arrive at those gates and they're going to realize that splendor and be welcomed in, well done, good and faithful servants. Because what little faith they had and how it might have trembled at times but it was locked in on Christ. Let me tell you something. Do you know whom you've believed? I mean, is that a reality in your life? When things get tough, do you, do you find yourself just 
by spiritual instinct running to Christ? Or do you find yourself running to money, running to the doctor, running to the human help, running to the educated, running to the books, running to this thing over here? Men will trust men all day long. But those that put their trust in the arm of the flesh, I'll tell you what, that's a rotten bridge and you're going down. Just ask yourself how you live life. Do you live life? Trust in the Lord. You're looking for an empty parking spot. You're saying, Lord, would you open up something? You find sickness and you're saying, Lord, would you help me? Not to despise the medical personnel out there, but you're running to the Lord. You find yourself trusting Him. you got problems in your spiritual life and the first thing you're off in the prayer closet and you're saying, Lord, I need help. I need help. I need help here with my marriage. I need help over here with the finances. Lord, I, the, the ends aren't meeting. I need Your help. You find yourself running there. Is that what it is? Is that what your life looks like? You know who you trust. You find that it shall come to pass everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you know what? That calling isn't a one-time thing. Did not Jesus Christ say it's those who endure to the end that are going to be saved? That doesn't mean that there isn't one time when you're saved. But what He's saying is, if you're saved one time, you go on believing. You go on being saved. You go on persevering. You go on and you endure to the end. You endure in what? You endure in the faith. You endure all the way to the end in a path of righteousness. You endure to the end fighting sin. You endure to the end laying hold on Christ. It's not a one-time thing. You endure repenting. You endure turning from sin. You endure in faith. And if you don't persevere to the end, you're not making it. Is that what your life is? Are you calling on the Lord? in an enduring fashion? Are you enduring to the end calling? I mean, is your life, is that characteristic of your life? You're calling on the Lord all the time. Lord, I need help. Lord, this. Lord, it's me again. I'm back. I need your help. That's what faith is. Faith is, I'm weak. You're strong. Faith is, I need your help. Faith is, Lord, you're my only hope. You're my only trust. Come on, you guys know if that's the way you live. You know it. You go to God's Word and, Lord, I, I, don't, I don't get this. I need Your help. Not running off to the arm of man all the time. Running off to the arm of flesh. Lord, I need help financially. You're not just running off to the credit cards. You're running to the Lord. Lord, I need You. I need Your help. Lord, i got this sin in my life. I just can't seem to... Lord, I need help here. Lord, my child's lost. What am I going to do? If you don't save the Lord, I'm done. I mean, let, let's go to a second thing. How can you know if you're saved? You know what? You not only know who you trust, you know who you love. Let me tell you something. Peter says this, though you have not seen Him, 1 Peter 1, verse 8, though you have not seen Him, you love Him. For so many people, Christianity means fire escape from hell. But if your Christianity is not a love affair, <coughs> You're not saved. You're not. The Apostle Paul says, right out of 1 Corinthians 16, if anyone has no love for the Lord, let him be accursed. If your Christian life is not a love affair with Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ said this, look, if you love your mother or father, you love your children, you love your husband, you love your wife, you love even your own self. You, you love anybody more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. Christianity, above all other things, is entering into relationship with God. The triune God, but especially entering into that close intimacy with Jesus Christ. Did Paul not say, 
oh, that I may know Him. This is the life of the child of God. It is an increasing upward intimacy and closeness with Jesus Christ. And look, you're not always going to perfectly be doing this. I know. I know. Times of coldness will come. There will be times when, yes, you'll struggle and, and seasons will come in where there will be a dry time. It may be even a season where you've denied the Lord. But you know how the Lord is. Peter, do you love me? Lord, I have a brotherly affection for you. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know, I have a brotherly affection for you. Peter, do you have a brotherly affection for me? The Lord came down to Peter's term. Peter wouldn't answer the Lord on the Lord's own terms and the Lord came down to his term and still questioned him. He said, Lord, you know all things. Guess what the Lord knew? Peter loved him. Peter paid the ultimate price for his love for Christ. So tradition tells us. Christ tells us too, does He not? You're going to be led where you don't want to go. Let me tell you something. If you've been saved, you know who you trust. You know who you love. And I'll tell you something else you know. You know what you hate. You guys can look over there. We don't have to look right now, but something like Galatians 5.24. Let me tell you something. You become a true child of God. You're truly saved from your sin. Let me tell you what happens. Your desires and your passions, those evil, those corrupt desires and passions are crucified. That's what Galatians 5.24 says in no uncertain terms. Let me tell you something. You truly saved. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness. They will be satisfied. Comes right on Matthew 5 the Beatitudes. Brethren, <coughs> folks, visitors here, let me tell you this. You have one of the most certain words on this that you will find in your Bibles in Romans 8.13. If you, by the Spirit, put to death, you go to war with sin, you will live. If that's not true, you will die. And Paul is certain of this. Why? Because regeneration brings a new heart. It brings the Spirit of God into a life. I guarantee you this. Every true child of God, as you learn in Romans chapter 8, possesses the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God will not live in you and allow sin to go unchallenged. If you are not at war with sin, if you are not hungering and thirsting after righteousness, if you can sit there and soak in your pride and soak in your sin and soak in your pornography and soak in your haughtiness and soak in this whatever it is, folks, and you... It is not challenged inside you. You're in your sin. I can tell you that with all authority of the Word of God. If you practice sin, you are of the devil. 1 John 3, what? Verses 9 following? You're of the devil. If you have the seed of God in you, if you've been born of God, you're going to be one who practices righteousness. What else? Folks, let me tell you this. One of the things that happened to me, and I'm not, I'm not giving this because my testimony is, is the basis for this truth. I'm just telling you this happens to Christians and it happened. When God saved me, it started a love affair not just with Christ, but with His Word. Oh, I loved the Bible. I could not get enough. I remember driving down the highway and I'm reading. I just could not get away from it. There was a hunger. Is that not what we find when in First, First Peter 2? You have this, this desire, this hunger, this appetite, just as a little babe 
for its mother's milk. We desire the sincere milk of the Word of God. Listen, Jesus Christ said this, There's a way that people will know if you're His disciple or not. And He says it has distinctly to do with you keeping His Word. If you are one who does not find yourself hungering for the Word, man does not live by bread alone. From every word that proceeds forth from the mouth of God. If you find that you do not have a regular appetite and hunger to be in God's Word, I, I can tell you, you're given great indication that you're not saved. You hunger, and you know what James said, you don't deceive your own self and be hearers only. The hunger for God's Word is not just a hunger to hear it, it's a hunger to do it as well. Let me give you one more. How about just a love for God's people? I mean, you know, 1 John is, is a tremendous test of true Christianity. And one of the things that just repeatedly comes at us again and again and again is that you love Christians. By this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. In other words, what's he saying? If you don't have love for one another, then that's proof you're not one of his disciples. And if you're not one of his disciples, folks, you're not saved. Because a saved person, that's what a true disciple is. They're saved. You say, well, yeah, oh yeah, you know, I, I like them. You know, Christians are nice people. I like to be. Look, love means. You're making sacrifices for them. You show your love by this. Jesus Christ said, this is love. You, you, you lay down your life for your friends. That's what love is. Don't give me any of this little, you know, I like to show up at a Bible study and be around. That's not what, that's not what he's getting at. He just got done in John 13, you know, washing the, the feet of his disciples right before. I mean, here he is on the very eve of going to lay his own life down under the wrath of his Father. You might think they'd be washing his feet. But he's washing their feet. And this is what he calls us to follow. This, I mean, those, I, I could give you five more. I could, be, I could give you ten more. But those are huge things. You want to know if you're saved? I mean, those, those are the types of things. And I, I, don't, I just don't think I can stress enough the second one that I brought out, just that you love Him. I mean, think with me, folks. <coughs> so many people have just such shallow ideas about Christianity. You know, well, not going to hell. Going to church and I got the truth and... Yeah, I'm saved. But they don't know Christ. They have never found Christ lovely. They have never found Christ precious. They have never found Him beautiful. They have never found that. You hear this in the heart of Paul, and I'm telling you, every true Christian, everyone who's truly been saved from the wrath, the fury, the indignation, the tribulation of God, they know this longing in their heart. Oh, that I may know Him. And you guys just imagine yourself. Go back, you know. Go back to the days of the Caesars. Go back. You can imagine, you know. Some of you have probably seen the, the old Roman movies. You've seen the Ben-Hurs. and the, You know, go back to that time. Imagine yourself back then. That is remotely what they looked like, what they dressed like, what it might have been like in that day. We see the ruins over there. We... We know, we, we have some idea. Go back there. You've seen pictures of the Colosseum. You can imagine. Let's take yourself back there. You're in the days of the Caesars. You're, you're in one of those lands that, that the Caesars, in all their conquest and bloodthirstiness and power thirstiness, they conquer your land. They take you. You're a slave. You've been basically conquered by these Roman soldiers and you're brought back to Rome. And there you are. You're thrown in jail. You're a slave. 
And now it's one of the it's one of the holy days are at hand. Whatever they're going to do over there, they're going to have some festivities to their gods, and they love to do this kind of thing and fill the Colosseum with all these people. And guess what? You're going to be part of the festivities. Bring you in there. You got several tens of thousands of people there in there. Who are you? Nobody there cares. They just, you're sport. This is a high day. Folks, they're having fun. They're drinking. They're at the Coliseum that day. You look at all those masses up there. They've given you a dagger. They've sent you out a door to the middle of that Coliseum. You imagine, you hear the clink, clink, clink. Some machinery hidden away somewhere begins to move and this great big iron door comes up. I mean, you just imagine. You look over there and out comes the king of beasts. I mean, one of the most ferocious lions and it comes out and it has been starved and it is hungry and they knew how to make those animals as savage as possible for the greatest sport. You've got a little dagger. There you are. You've got to kill that thing. And you're just full of terror. You can see it. It is growling. It roars. Your whole body, just all strength goes out. You can see those teeth. You know your bones are about to be crushed between them. Your blood's going to drip from them as sure as anything. that thing starts to charge and suddenly some defender jumps out of the stand. Somebody you've never seen. He's upon that lion. He tears that thing up. He sends it down. It's like a whip dog. It turns and it hightails away. It's injured. It's, it's been defeated. This conqueror comes over and lifts you up and smiles in your face and says you're free. And suddenly you're whisked out of that place and out into the open street and breathing the free, cool air. And suddenly you've got servants and they whisk you off into some mansion and the table is full of food and they begin to bandage all your wounds that you've gotten when you were captured and all the military endeavor there. And they are, are soothing your wounds and they're putting medicines on it and they begin to give you everything and you've got changes of clothes and everything your heart can desire and you don't even get to the place where you're hungry. New food's on the table all the time and you're asking the servants that come around, who is this? Who did this? Well, the one that rescued you there in the Colosseum, it was him. You say, well, who is he? He said, what do you mean, who is he? Isn't it enough for you that he rescued you? Isn't it enough for you? He's giving you all these things. No, I want to know him. I mean, who is this? And every day, everything your heart can desire and everything is given to it. You know, all the meals are there and all the clothing and everything that you could want and it's put there. And you, you are inquiring of these stewards and these, these servants about this one who has saved you, this defender, this one that is, has set you free and, and you find out and these servants tell you, we'll tell you this, he's off doing many things in, in your behalf right now and you come to find out he's even given his life for you. He suffered such wounds and he suffered such damage to his own person and he's done it for you. And you, you're hearing all these stories and all these things come back to you and all that he's done for you. And you might just want to start thinking, I want to know Him. I want to know where He is. And I know this is just a small little picture, but let me tell you, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is there at the right hand of the Father. And He's interceding for us. And He's got our best interests in mind and everything. I'll tell you what, you go to read in the Scriptures, all things are yours. All the things in this world are yours. And right now, you are seated in heavenly places with Him. And through Jesus Christ, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours. We have all these things. You have such inheritance that you cannot even imagine. There are such riches in Jesus Christ. I mean, He is this great defender. 
He's loved us with a love that is not even imaginable. And look, if none of this means anything to you, if there's nothing that wells up in your heart, I want to know Him. I want to know Him. I mean, if that's the farthest thing, if in all your religion you just can't even identify with that, you're not saved. You're not saved. I can tell you that on the authority of God's Word. The inspired apostle says, if there's no affection there in your heart for Him, in light of what He's done, in light of the love that He's shown, let you be accursed. You're not saved. If you don't know anything about a love affair with Jesus Christ, my beloved is mine and I am His. If that doesn't enter in, if you, don't, if you can't go there, if that's ground that just your feet have not tread upon, I tell you why you have life and breath. He's a Savior still. And He rescues all those that come unto Him. And He will not turn you away. And you will find Him ready and willing to bathe you in His love in ways that nobody on this earth can love you. I tell you, these things, they're proof positive. These things will be true. The Bible doesn't leave us without the proofs of whether you truly know Jesus Christ. May God help you that are not saved to not go out of here deceived. To not stiffen your neck and harden your heart and go out and tread that path to destruction. It'll be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in that day than it will be for you to hear this and to turn your back on it and walk away. God help you not to do it. Father, I pray that you would have mercy upon some lost soul in this place. I pray it, Lord, for Christ's sake. I pray that you might bathe them with that love. Give them a hunger for Your Word. Give them the powerful Holy Spirit to overcome sin. Give them that faith which will endure to the end. Give them that love for the brethren that is such a trademark of Your people. Lord, save their soul from certain damnation. <coughs> We read that Jesus Christ came to seek and to save. This is an acceptable saying that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Lord, we trust that. May that text be proven, Lord, in our midst tonight. Do what we can't do, Lord. Do what I can't do. I pray in Christ's name.